We believe that each of us in our distinct embodiments can be for each other, and that there can be wisdom and discovery in identifying shared experiences as well as clarifying the distinctions that certainly are at play. Thus, tonight's lecture focuses on Asian theologies, voices, and experiences, and our panelists will then engage this topic from their own lenses in a spirit of cross-advocacy, solidarity, and respect and understanding for difference. So now I welcome Dean De La Rosa as she will introduce our honorable speaker tonight. It is my privilege tonight to introduce um, our keynote speaker and uh, serve as moderator for this panel. Dr. Po Pulan um, is Dean's Professor of Systematics Theology at Kendall School of Theology, Emory University, and a past president of the American Academy of Religion. She has authored and edited 23 books on Asian and Asian American feminist theology, biblical interpretation, and post-colonial criticism. An internationally known theologian, she received her doctorate from Harvard University. Her publications include Postcolonial Politics and Theology, or Coming, Globalization, Gender, and Peace Building, Postcolonial Imagination and Feminist Theology, and also Discovering the Bible in the Non-Biblical World. She's also the editor of Women and Christianity in Four Volumes, and has taught, has taught at Episcopal Divinity School, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, Auburn Theological Seminary and Union Theological Seminary and Yale Divinity School. So we welcome you tonight. Good evening. I would like to thank the Impact and the Boston University School of Theology for this very kind invitation to deliver the Lowell Lecture this the topic of my address tonight is political theology in Asian Pacific. On March 16th this year, eight women, including six women of Asian descent, were killed by a white gunman in the spa shootings in the Atlanta area. My school, Kendra School of Theology, is located at Atlanta. And my students were very concerned about that incident. Asian and Asian American students organized prayer rituals in my school, and even went to one of the spas to express solidarity with the victims and their families. The Atlanta shootings, however, is not just a single incident, but the number of cases of anti-Asian violence has increased drastically since COVID-19 pandemic. According to Scott's AAPI page, there has been more than 6,600 incidents of anti-Asian racism and hate crimes from March 2020 to March 2021. President Donald Trump's references to the coronavirus as China virus or Kung Fu created an atmosphere as if Asians are to be blamed for the virus. This rhetoric intensified the tension that has already existed between China and the US because of the trade war, the Ted Cold War, and other competition between the US and China. When I looked for resources to help me to understand or make sense of changing geopolitical situations in Asian Pacific, I found a dearth of material. The majority of books on politics and theology, they focus on Europe, the US, or the North Atlantic, and there are only few resources 
on Asian Pacific. Although, as we all know, the 21st century has been dubbed the Pacific century. While China loomed very large in political debate and foreign policy debate, many theologians remained steeped in a Eurocentric mindset and had not caught up with the current moment. I suggest those colleagues are doing theology for the 19th century. <laughs> they barely caught up with the 20th. Never mind, this is 2021. Post-colonial theology can contribute to broadening our theological imagination by challenging Eurocentric biases in its conceptualization of political theology as a field of study, which has so far not taken seriously political questions I would call from the majority world. Instead of a Eurocentric genealogy of political theology that focuses on Europe or Euro-America, I argue tonight for a transnational and multicultural origins of political theology, using the developments in Asian Pacific as an example. In this lecture, I would explore Asian Pacific as a space for political theology. And then I highlight the contributions of Asian American theologians and ethicists before moving on to emergent issues that shaped our future discussion. So, my first session, Asian Pacific as a space for doing political theology. Many scholars trace the origin of modern political theology to Carl Smith's Political Theology, published in 1922, during a time of political crisis after World War I. Smith famously said, all significant concepts of the modern theory of the state are secularized theological concepts. From Smith, scholars would trace the development of political theology within theological discourse through Johann Baptist Mess, Newton Bookman, Dorothy Solon after the Second World War, before moving on to the present theological turn in political discourse on both sides of the Atlantic. Such a white genealogy of modern political theology traces its origin to Europe as it grappled with political crisis of the two world wars. This genealogy foregrounds the worlds and works of European and Euro-American theologians, praising their reflections on politics at the center of inquiry. To shift, to expand, our attention to Asian Pacific, I propose to you a post-colonial and transnational approach that underscores the colonial impact of the regional formation of Asian Pacific. For Asian Pacific is a contested term. Pacific as a regional formation developed as the result of European and American capitalist expansion. The Pacific region, as we have come to know today, was an invention of Europe. Christopher Columbus' original intention was to go to India. Remember that? <laughs> and he was discovered and called inha inhabitants of the land Indians. By doing so, the Pacific emerged in the European consciousness as an expansion 
of the conquest of the Americas. The Pacific was called a Spanish lake during the 16th and 17th century. And then the English lake from the 18th to the 19th century. With the rise of the United States in the late 19th century, it was renamed an American Lake. Although the peoples living in the region have their diverse cultures and ways of life, it was Euro-American powers that invented the regional structure, both economically and ideologically, to serve their capitalist interest. I quote from historian Eric Durer. He said, entering the Pacific from the west or the east, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, the Dutch, the Russians, and the English, as well as their colonists in the Americas, all contributed in turn to the creation of a regional structure in which Asian and Pacific societies provided the building blocks and the globalized interest of Euro-American powers furnished the principles of organization. Well, recognizing this history, we must learn insights from post-colonial theory to scrutinize the developments of politics and religion in this regional formation. First, Edward Said has taught us to read histories contrapuntally and to see histories and politics as always intertwined and overlapped. Around the time when Swift was very busy penning the book, Political Theology. Political crisis of a different kind emerged in China. On May 4, 1919, students in Beijing took to the streets to protest the transfer to Japan of Germany's rights over China's Shandong Peninsula at the Paris Peace Conference after World War I, even though China had ended the war on the side of Allied powers. Germany has previously obtained the right to build a naval base in Qingdao in 1898 to extend its military power in the Pacific. After the students' protest, a mass movement swept throughout the country, denouncing Western imperialism and demanding democracy alongside radical social and cultural reforms. In China, Smith's contemporary, Wu Yaozhong, advocated in the 1930s that only a social revolution could save China and transform the world. He urged other Christians to embrace a revolutionary Christianity because for him, Christianity should not only attend to people's spiritual lives, but should also care for their social and physical condition. Chastising the exploitation of European capitalistic powers, Wu Yangzhong was increasingly attracted to socialism and saw China's only way out as through a social revolution. His appeals to Marxist critique and his criticism of idealist Christianity anticipated liberation theology that came decades later. Second, post-colonial the theory emphasized the need to challenge established social imaginaries and disciplinary boundaries. Political theology in Asian Pacific cannot be based on realized 
neophyte notions of nation, culture, people, race, gender, and sexuality, and must adopt a transnational and trans-Pacific approach. The pivot of the US to Asia means that Asian Pacific will be a strategically and militarily important region for years to come. The US has already stepped up to strengthen its bilateral relations with many Asian countries. As the uptake of anti-Asian hatred and violence has shown, American attitudes towards Asian Americans have long been influenced by the ways Americans perceive Asians. This means that there can be no hard and fast boundary between Asian studies on the one hand and Asian American studies on the other. Korean American theologian Wu Hei and Zhou writes, while Asian Americans do well to understand their violence and imperialism as experienced by Asians, Asians also would do well to discern how the engine of this imperialism works within the United States against Asian Americans through the violence of white racism. Mutual understanding of different oppressions might lead us to formulate new ways of participating in liberation movements that are inter and intra-national. So, Tonight, as we move on, I want to come to the third point. Post-colonial theory challenges a political discourse that focuses on masculinist, nationalist, and elitist political agency to the neglect of women, racial and ethnic minorities, subalterns, sexual minorities, and other marginalized groups. This means politic, politics must be understood broadly and not limited to the discussion of the state, sovereignty, government, and political economy. Because if you focus on those, you rule out many voices. The subaltern's voices, the woman's voices might be left out. Therefore, we need to pay attention to how the intersectionality of race, gender, sexuality, age, heritage, etc., is shaped by the political process, and how imperialistic impulses also change social patterns and disrupt gender and sexual relations. In the past, the field of political theology tends to privilege the voices of male scholars and we need to include multiple perspectives to broaden our theological horizon. As the above discussion has shown, the context for political theology in Asian Pacific is post-colonial and the imperial. This reality stands in very sharp contrast to the postmodern and growing populist and nationalistic political climate of North America. Political theologies do not come from one origin or beginning, but it has many diverse origins and multiple genealogies. Political theologies from Asia, Africa, or Latin America would be very different because they might have different understandings of the relationship between politics and religion. As an interdisciplinary project, political theology can learn from the insights 
of post-colonial studies, subaltern studies, critical race theory, and transnational and global studies. A contrapuntal and intersectional approach will be important if we are to grasp the overlapping struggles in the past, decipher the dense political present, and to envision a different future. I come to my second part, political theology in Asian America. Although we have seen a spike of cases of anti-Asian racism, but the discrimination and the uh, oppression against Asian Americans has had a very long history in the US. In the 19th century, Chinese laborers came to the US to work during the gold rush, first in the mining and later in railroads, agriculture, and laundries. They were not allowed to bring their wives and families with them. White Americans labeled Asians at the time Orientals and considered them not assimilable because of their different languages, cultures, and religions. People of Asian descent were subjected to racism and xenophobia and were often associated with poor hygiene and diseases. One of the stereotypes of Asian immigrants was yellow pearl, popularized in the late 19th and early 20th century. White Americans feared that the yellow race will threaten the domination of the white race because of the huge population in East Asia. China's potential for political and military power and Japan's rise as a regional power fueled the anxiety that the general race was a menace and presented economic, political, military, and cultural threats to the white race. This attitude played a critical role in the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was the first and only major federal legislation to suspend immigration for a specific nationality. The yellow pearl stereotype was influenced by both domestic and international changes. As Japan expanded its imperialistic ambition and contested U.S. hegemony in the Asian Pacific, the Yellow Pearl came to mean Japan. During World War II, some 120,000 Japanese Americans, most of whom lived on the Pacific coast, were relocated in concentration camps in Eastern California and the Western interior of the country. Under such trying circumstances, Buddhist and Christian priests and religious leaders provided religious services and tended to the spiritual needs of the internees. They created altars, rock gardens, and shrines in dining halls and community meeting spaces. At the Manansa Relocation Center in the Eastern California Desert, Marino sisters chose to stay with internees to continue their mission work. Young Japanese American clergy, seminarians, and lay leaders tried to provide the kind of roles they had played in the churches before the incarceration, working to maintain some sense of normalcy and continuality. They helped internees to find meaning amidst their forced relocation. They emphasized 
the critical messages of the Exodus. And the temptation of Christ, as well as the meaning of the cross, to develop a theology that will sustain congregational unity and faith in the future. Reflections of Christian faith during the internment years represented some of the earliest efforts to do political theology from an Asian American perspective. Then, in the 1960s, the stereotype of Asian Americans as model minority began to be portrayed in mainstream media. The success stories of Japanese and Chinese Americans were touted and held up as models for other racial and ethnic minorities to emulate. Asian Americans were seen as succeeding through making effort on their own, and their success was attributed to their close family ties, emphasis on education, law-abiding character, and other cultural traits. It was no coincidence that the model minority myth was popularized during the civil wars, civil rights movement, and black power protests. Why? The model minority myth held the success of Asian Americans to deny the existence of institutionalized racism. Look, the Asian Americans make it. If you try harder, pay attention to your schools and what is happening around and work hard. You can be like them. That is why you have a wedge that divides the Asian Americans from the black and the brown cohorts. Now this image of the model minority is not fair. Why? When you look at the differences between household incomes in different regions in the US and among the different ethnic groups in the Asian American communities, you will see the so-called model minority was and continues to be a myth. So participation in civil rights movements aroused the political consciousness of Asian Americans. From a very small, disconnected, and largely invisible ethnic groups, they organized to form a self-identified racial group and began calling themselves Asian Americans. Asian American Christian leaders began to challenge racial stereotypes and racism in the church and wider society. Some of them began to form caucuses in mainline denominations in the United Methodist Church, in the Presbyterian Church, or in my own denomination, the Episcopal Church. They also then challenged the dominance of Eurocentric theology and liturgy within their different denominations and tradition. Some of, the, some of you uh, may know that uh, by a person that is called Royal Sano. Royal Sano obviously is one of the pioneers. And uh, I am rebooting uh, my uh, computer, so just take a little moment. <laughs> uh, sometimes technology works. Sometimes <laughs> it may be challenging. So in the 1960s, this um, movement in the Asian participation in the civil rights movement led some of the early Asian American 
theologians and church leaders to begin to think what would an Asian American theology look like. So this, you can see on this slide, is one of the first anthologies of Asian American theology, published by the Asian Center for Theology and Strategies in 1976. Here is our beloved Royal Simon and UMC Bishop when he was much younger. <laughs> <laughs> and in this anthology, most of the authors were male. But I am glad to draw your attention to the fact that we also have a few Asian American women. Can you see the name Violet Masuda or Donna Dong? And also from the Filipino background, Patricia Link Nadamo. When I first saw the name, I was so moved. 1976, we had a cohort of Asian American women who joined their brother theologians to articulate faith according to Asian American experience and perspective. This is deeply moving because my generation of theologians stand on their shoulders because they have said, and now, now my generation can even say louder. And then later, our colleague, Jonathan, wrote this book, Introducing Asian American Theologies. He said, the pioneers of Asian American theologians, they engage debate with their Caucasian counterparts about the ethnocentrism of US Christianity and US theologies. The significance of their struggles lie in the creation of Asian American Christian identity and theologizing. Race, nation, and citizenship were major concerns. Now these pioneers have paved the way for the second generation, who represents a much broader cross-section of Asian Americans, disciplines, religious backgrounds, and denominational background. These theologians came into prominence in the 1990s and the 2000s, and had more freedom and space to address internal challenges within the Asian American communities. They began to use an intersectional approach to discuss race, class, gender, sexuality, Christian hegemony, and militarism. A leading voice, of course, is Rita Nagashima Brock. As a biracial person, she was not satisfied with the characterization of Asian American identity as somewhat marginal or limited. That is why she called this phrase interstitial interpreting, which she defines as the spirit in us, our struggle to hold the many in the one. She said, we endeavor to make sense and meaning out of the multiple social locations, the hybrid cultures, and the many powers of death and life, they are placed before us. Then we have the Asian American queer theologians joining the sympathy, such as Patrick S. Chang and Jun E. Yun, who argue that while Asian American churches have challenged racism, 
but they are still steeped in heterosexism and binary gender constructs. Calling the church into accountability, they insist that race, gender, and sexuality intersect with one another in the oppression of Asian Americans. With the pivot of the US to Asia and increased military threats in Asian Pacific, more theological reflections on militarism and militarized violence, both locally and globally, is needed. I commend to you this pioneering book, Critical Theology Against U.S. Militarism in Asia, edited by Nami Kim and Wolfie and Joe. In the introduction, the editors write, it is within militarized violence that the formation of the Jesus movement and the emergence of Christianity took place. As a movement that was at its heart a response to the legacy of militarized violence, it is critical that Christian theology offer an account of its relationship to militarized violence today. And Cho argues that colonialism and militarism affect not only physical and material conditions, but also leave an indelible impact on the psyches of the colonized. Chu studies the unrelenting grief and loss in people who have experienced devastating wars and traumas, such as the Koreans in the Korean War. Such grief is deep and haunting and may pass to the next generation, to those who have not had direct experience of the war. When grief is suppressed and not adequately dealt with, it can result in immobilization, anguish, and depression. But grief, Dr. Cho says, can also be transformed into post-colonial critical melancholia, in which the feelings of loss and melancholy can be channeled into survival and resistance. Her analysis of grief is so timely, as many Asian Americans feel depressed, if not sad about the rising anti-Asian hatred. As we mourn the many victims of anti-Asian violence, when the zero peril myth seems to have returned, we must transform grief and sadness into strength so that we can continue to fight white hegemony. Now, I come to my last part, emergent issues. Can I just ask you to imagine what would be two emergent issues? If you are to name two future issues that we need to attend to, what would they be? Let me tell you my two issues, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love to hear about your two issues. One of the most important issues for political theology in Asian Pacific is number one, Sino-American competition and its impact on the world. How many of you got that? Not quite. <laughs> I want to hear what are your issues. The rise of China has fractured the Germany of the U.S. The tension between China and U.S. are oh. as encapsulated <laughs> in two slogans. One slogan is Donald Trump's, make America great again. <laughs> and Xi Jinping has a counterpart, the Chinese dream. Commentators have divergent perspectives 
about the future of Sino-American relations. Let me offer three propositions. The first, win-win, popularized some years ago. Why win-win? Because if these two countries collaborate, then or be admitted China to the WTO and other organizations, China will change. It will become westernized, like us. Will be democratic. Well, of course, today you didn't hear that much. <laughs> <laughs> so we tried the second one. Bipolar world. This is from the CNN by Rich Zachariah. Many years ago, he said bipolar, not bipolar, multipolar. But now, he said bipolar. The world will be defined if not dominated by these two powers. How they work together or not work together really will define human destiny for a long time. But what about the third? Wow, that third is very cool. Because there was this Greek scholar, remember that? Who said this, who said, if one empire has risen up to compete with and try to overturn the older empire, war and clash will be inevitable. So which positions are you hoping? <laughs> Let me tell you, Americans' attitudes toward China has been influenced by Christian churches and their leaders and theologians. Do you know that? China used to be one of the largest mission fields. Here, I have two well-known missionaries in China, and the schools and the uh, church established by Methodist missionaries in China. Now, obviously, during that time, when China established itself, and then the republic was formed, the People's Republic, and kicked out the missionaries, many churches harbored a very harsh feeling. They were both by with the title, How We Have Lost China, as if China belongs to them. <laughs> Least you do not know, there was a book published in the 1920s that is called Christian Occupation of China. And obviously, now, China said, thank you. Go back home. <laughs> <laughs> they said, we have lost China. There was one very important theologian by the name of Rigo Niebuhr. I am sure many of you have heard that name. Rigo Niebuhr was very much against communism. He supported the containment policy against the Soviet Union. The target at that time was not China. China was too weak during the Cold War era. But he supported that. The neocons appropriated rival Lieber's anti-communist ideology. Though Lieber rethought his own Cold War policy because of the nightmare of Vietnam. He came out against the Vietnam War. But anyway, the not only Rahul Lieber was then becoming an instrument or a tool for the new cause. We have the political scientist Samuel Huntington, who then talks about the fault lines. We are doing war would be between Western culture and the Islamic and the Sinic cultures. And that is why we must be vigilant of this kind of rhetoric, because it can be very dangerous. This is the 20th anniversary of September 11. And then, 
the fourth line between Western culture and the Islamic culture, in some quarters of the United States, is still very alive. What about the fourth line between Western culture, Sydney, that is the Chinese culture? So I think it is important for us to think about are we still talking about we are against China because it's a communist country? I think you better wake up. This is 2021. China is not practicing pure communism. China says we are practicing socialism with Chinese characteristics. <laughs> Very good term. Outside, it is called state capitalism. Okay, so if this is not very up to date, how should we be thinking about what is happening in terms of Sino-American competition? I would argue globalization and neoliberalism have produced a transnational capitalist class which dominates the economy and has huge impact on politics, whether they live in Washington or Beijing, New York or Shanghai. Many Christians are against the autocratic government of China because of its lack of democracy and transparency. Christian theologians and ethicists need to speak out against China's violation of human rights, persecutions of religious and ethnic minorities, and violent suppressions of protests for democracy. At the same time, we need to be vigilant about the decline of civic liberties and political freedoms, not only in China, but around the world. And the US is no exception. In the last several years, there have been an outpouring of books after books that talks about how democracies die on tyranny, the retreat of Western liberalization. I do not need to remind you the Capitol riot on January the 6th and the rise of white supremacies show that our democratic institutions has been under and continue to be under serious attack. Given these stark economic and political realities, my students ask me, where is the hope? So where is your hope? My hope lies in the protest movements, the rising up of multitudes in many different parts of the world in the last several years, especially around the countries in Asia Pacific. Here you can see in 2019, millions of people in Hong Kong protested an extradition bill and stood up for democracy. China's imposition of the national security law and recent suppression of freedom of the press by the Hong Kong government have caught worldwide attention. In addition, other mass protests have taken place in India, Philippines, Thailand, Myanmar, and the US. In response to these people's movements, political theologians need to develop strategies and theologies of the multitude that emphasize people as subjects of history and God's solidarity with the oppressor. Western discourse on civil disobedience has been influenced by the work of John Rawls. His theory would only work in nearly just society in which people trust the legal system and law enforcement but may not work 
under corrupt or authoritarian governments. In ability to resist, you can see this was quickly translated into Chinese. The Candice Delmas argued that we not only have the duty to obey the law, but we also have the duty to justice. On her account, the obligation to resist injustice demands principled disobedience, and such disobedience need not always be civil. Political theology in Asian Pacific will need to develop an ethical framework to evaluate the complexity and multiple dimensions of social protest. Now, I come to my second issue before the conclusion. What was your second issue? COVID-19. COVID-19. Well, thank you very much. That is very important. But I have a slightly different issue. <laughs> <laughs> Another issue we need to pay attention to is solidarity between Asian Americans and other racial and ethnic minority groups, especially African Americans. Facing the escalating anti-Asian hatred, many Asian Americans have argued that they are invisible because racial discourse in the U.S. has been defined in a black and white binary. Given the national reckoning of institutional racism, it is all the more important for racial and ethnic minority communities to work together. I want to draw your attention to the fact that in the 1920s, Du Bois call upon black Americans to support Indian anti-colonial struggles and compare colonialism to white oppression of blacks. During the Civil War movement, Japanese American activist Yuri Kuchiyama worked side by side with Malcolm X. Different racial groups formed alliances to fight against the Vietnam War. Asian Americans and Hispanic Latino groups have worked together for immigration reform. They organize to support the DREAM Act because one out of every 10 dreamers are Asians. In the aftermath of the LA riot, my colleague, Korean-American theologian Andrew Sangpa, wrote this important book, Racial Conflict and Healing, an Asian-American Theological Perspective. He uses the Korean terms of harm and joy to describe the deep-seated suffering of racial oppression and suggest resources for understanding and healing in both Christian and Asian traditions. Nami Hill, who taught for many, many years and continues to teach at Spelman College, is another scholar who has written on Asian and Black American solidarity. Nami Kim is one of the pioneers connecting the studies of Afro-Black Orientalism with religions and theological studies. Kim notes in her pioneering book, Sisters in the Wilderness, womanist theologian Delores S. Williams has called for dialogue between womanist and Asian American feminist theologians and to make cross-racial connections. To push the conversation further, a group of Asian American feminist scholars who belongs to the group Pacific Asian North American Asian Women in Theology and Ministry, they are working on this volume entitled Embodying Anti-Racism, 
Haitian American Christianity and Feminist Theologies. If in 2040 there will be no majority race in the country, have we prepared for that scenario? This book seeks to explore how anti-Asian racism is intricately connected to anti-black racism. anti-blackness through the model minority belief and challenges the way Asian American theological discourse contribute to racial, gender, and economic injustice. This is really a prophetic warning for Asian Americans and beyond. As Asian Americans fight against Asian anti-Asian violence, we appreciate the support and solidarity of black civic and religious leaders. Many people supported those protests organized by Asian Americans. The African American presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church said, we must stand up speak up and show up. Today, we do so with and for our Asian American and Pacific Islander brothers, sisters, and siblings. Let me conclude. The shifting U.S. and Asian relations provides a really good case to look at political theology globally from many diverse vantage points. The stigmatization of Asian Americans during the pandemic is directly related to the growing tensions between China and the US. It shows that the yellow pearl leaf never disappears, and at times, it only remains dormant. Japanese American scholar Gary Togahiro says, the yellow pearl and the model minorities are not two poles with two leaves, denoting opposite representations along a single line. But in fact, form a circular relations that moves in either direction. Political theology from Asian Pacific leads to challenge these beliefs and the growing threats to democratic participation and human rights. The previous generation of theologians have done their part. Today, we have to respond to the signs of our time and develop political theologies that are transnational, comparative, multicultural, and heal alliances and solidarity across national, racial, religious, and geographical boundaries for our common future. Thank you.